Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Brian Bible Church. It's great to be here. I just, I've enjoyed our worship time so far this morning. Um, it's been good. Kind of a little bit sad this morning. We're finishing John 17. I look so forward to getting to this chapter because it's always meant a lot to me. And now this morning we're finishing it up, which means we also end our study of the Upper Room Discourse. This is our 31st and last message in the Upper Room Discourse. Now, we have to keep in mind that all this teaching and the prayer all took place in one evening. So what has taken us 31 hours so far probably got accomplished in more like four hours. All right? Three or four hours. So, so all this teaching and the prayer took place right before the crucifixion. We're looking at the final portion of the Lord's Prayer, the part where he prays for us. Verse 20 says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is us, people. This is us. Those who will believe. That's us. Through their word. We believe through the word of the apostles because it's been written down. We read it. We understand the gospel. We come to trust them. So these seven verses, in closing here, the Lord prays for us. That's you and me and every other believer who's ever lived. One of the things that the Lord prays for us is unity. And we looked at this last week. He prays for unity in verse 11, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 21, that they all may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Now the words just as here in verse 21 and even as in verse 22 speak of the nature of our unity. It is to be like that of Yeshua and the Father. It's a common life. It's not people who are joined together because they're in the same container organizationally. It's people who are one because they share the same nature. Now let me ask you, how do we know beyond a doubt that Christ is not praying for practical unity. He's not praying, oh, we just want you all to get along in the church. Don't want you to fight with each other. I want you to just, you know, be good to each other. How do we know that's not happening? That's not what the prayer is. Because it's not happening. <laughs> okay? That's a clue, people. Do you think the Lord prayed for things and He didn't get them? No. We've talked about that. You've got to get that okay, with this prayer. He got what he prayed for. He prayed for unity. He got it. Look around the church. You see organizational unity? You see practical unity? No. The church does not have that today. We said last week there's over 40,000 Christian denominations. Okay? I don't know if that's unity to you, but it doesn't sound like it to me, all right? I believe that the unity, the oneness that Christ is praying for here is something that we see so central in the New Testament. It's the unity of Jews and Gentiles being one in Christ. And we know that prayer was answered. Now the final section that we're looking at today emphasizes the security of the believer. Which means, by what, when we say security of the believer, it means that once you become a Christian by faith in Christ, you can never be lost. Now the church is greatly divided on that. This is an area that there's no unity in, okay? You got the Calvinists who understand the tulip. He saved us. And you got the Arminians who have the daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. Okay? So, <laughs> you'll get that later. <laughs> Listen, once you become a son of God, no matter how messed up your behavior may get, you're saved. You're secure because your security is in Christ. Listen, people, we have to understand this. Our sin does not affect our position. You need to say amen to that because if you don't, you know, you understand. You know, we still go on sinning. We still do things we shouldn't do. You know, that doesn't affect our position. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake He made Him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that, we, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. People, Yeshua took our sin. Now listen, every bit of it. He took our sin. 
All of it. Past, present, future. He took it all and He bore it on the cross and He gave us His righteousness. We stand before God perfectly righteous because we're in Christ. And anything less than Christ's righteousness doesn't cut it. The eternal security of the believer is a matter of our position in Christ before God. This is something Christ did for us. It has nothing to do with what we do. We can't secure this position by the kind of life we live. The security rests in the death we died in Christ. Our eternal security before God is a matter of grace. Grace is what God gives us, not what we do. If your security depends on you, you're going to be in a bad state. Constantly in turmoil. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Believe it, we are secure in our salvation just as Christ is secure in the Trinity, all right? Because we are in the Beloved. That's our position. That's why we're blessed. Security is in Him. We've already seen the idea of security in this prayer in verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to Thee, Holy Father. Keep through Thine own name, those whom You have given Me, that they may be one, even as we are. Now the phrase, keep them, has the idea of keep them loyal to You. Protect them. Loyalty seems to be the objective here in keeping them. Knowing the temptations they're about to face very soon as He goes to the cross, in His absence, He prays that they will remain loyal in the midst of the trials and temptations they're going to face. Now, Maybe some of you notice I used the King James here. Because I think that the Texas Receptus does a better job here than Westcott and Hort in this idea of those whom you gave me. Alright? Westcott and Hort make it sound here like it's the name that was given and not the people that are given. Yeshua is asking the Father to keep those whom He has given Him. Now let me ask you something. Do you think that the Father answered the Son's prayers? I mean, if Yeshua prayed that the Father would keep the given, then the given were kept. Would you agree with that? Or else the Lord's frustrated, praying for things He just can't get them. I wish you'd do this, Lord. He gets His prayers answered. Look at verse 23. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. I and them, and you and me. Yeshua implies that He would indwell believers as the Father has indwelled Him. Now people, here's what we have to understand today. All three members of the Godhead indwell the Christian. This is the great doctrine of a union with Christ. This is the doctrine that Paul talks about. We see it in Romans chapter 6. He says, for if we have been united with Him in His death, like, in, in death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. The word here, united, in the Greek word, sumphutos, which literally means grown together with. It's usually the edges of a wound or fusing of a broken bone together. It has the idea of being grafted into something. And the perfect tense demonstrate this is not a gradual growing into His death. This is a good picture of what happened to us when Christ died. God grafted us into Yeshua the Christ as He died on the cross. He joined us to Him, listen, so that the effects of His death in bearing the wrath of God while being poured out on Christ were by that act poured out on us too. We died with Him. He stood in our place. The effects of what He did were just as if God had poured His fierce wrath out on us. It's so important we understand this. We have been united with Him. Now there are several other texts in Paul's writings that show us the all-important place of this union with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 And because of Him, Christ, you are in Christ Yeshua, because of the Father, because of Him as the Father, you are in Christ Yeshua, 
who became to us wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now notice that it's God who creates the union. The New American Standard here has, by God's doing, are you in Christ Yeshua. I like that. I think it's clear. It's literally from Him you are in Christ. He creates the union by His grace. We embrace it by faith. We're united to Christ. Now notice the importance of this union with Christ. If you are in Christ by God's doing, Christ becomes for you the wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All that Christ is for you, He is for you because you are in Him. Because you're united to Him. He says He prays that we may become perfectly one. Now the original text, this is a hint of clause, that they may be come perfectly one. And it's uh, with a, pa a perfect passive participle having been perfected. So it's an already accomplished act. I'm praying that they will have already been perfected while they're in the world. The body, all believers, are perfectly one because we are in Christ. It's an organic unity. We share His life. He says that the world may know that you sent me. Now in verse 21, Yeshua says, so the world may believe that you sent me. And here He says, so that the world may know that you sent me. If the world is going to believe or know that the Father sent the Son, it is because the world that He's talking about are the elect of God. They are the given who are in the world. The word world that is used here is used as it is in John 3.16 to mean the elect from both Jews and Gentiles. That, that the world may know. It's the elect in the world, the chosen, the given in the world, may know that you have sent me and love them even as you love me. Now people, stop for a second and let's focus on this phrase here. This has to be one of the most remarkable statements in the Bible. Do you see what it's saying? Who is the them here? You love them. Who's them? It's believers. It's us. It's us, okay? The given. It's us. Who is the me here? Christ, right? So what's it saying? Christ is saying that the Father loves us as much as He loves Him. Can you grasp the significance of that? Do you know how much God loves Christ? He loves you in the same manner. D.A. Carson writes this, Would to God that the truths of these verses might burn themselves into our memories. It is a rare and holy privilege to observe the divine Son of God, not only formulating His prayers, but formulating the grounds for His petitions. These grounds reflect the essential unity of the Father and Son and reveal that Jesus' prayers for His people trace their argument back to the inscrutable purpose of deity. When the Son of God Himself has offered prayers for His followers like these prayers, and when the prayers have been grounded as these prayers have been grounded, it is horrifying to remember that in moments of weakness and doubt, we still rebelliously question the love of God for His own people. This passage ought rather to engender the deepest and most stable faith, the most adoring gratitude. The disciples of Jesus Christ are loved with a special love which distinguishes them from the world. We are loved by the Father as He loves the Son. So how does He love the Son? Well, He loves them infinitely. He loves them without measure. John 3.35, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. John 5.20, The Father loves the Son and shows Him all He Himself is doing. And greater works than these will He show Him so that He may marvel. 10.17, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. The Father loves the Son ultimately, infinitely, eternally, which means He loves us ultimately, infinitely, eternally. And that's why Paul said in Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, the theme of this section in Romans 8, verses 31-39, through is the love of God for His people. Paul's question here is, if God is for us, who's against us? 
It expects a negative answer. No one. If God's for us, nobody can stand against us. When Paul says, if God is for us, he's not saying, maybe, I'm not sure if he is. This is a first class conditional sentence and should be read since God is for us or because God is for us. People, there's no truth more fundamental in all of God's word than this truth. God is for us. Now, do you, sometimes we're tempted to question that because of our circumstances. We don't like our circumstances. Well, God, are you really on my side? All you have to do, look at the cross. And then ask yourself, is God on my side? Does he love me? God is for us. Because of Yeshua's death and resurrection, once and for all, the question is settled. God's for us. All that God is, all that God has, all that God does, he does on behalf of his people. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer expected is nothing. The genitive Christos is subjective, denoting Christ's love for believers. And who's going to separate us from the love that Christ has for us? Who will do that? I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Yeshua our Lord. I'm sure, Paul says, the word sure here means to be fully and absolutely persuaded on the basis of evidence that can't be denied. He used the perfect passive indicative verb here. The perfect tense means something like this. I was persuaded in the past and I'm fully persuaded in the present. I used to believe this and I still believe it now. The passive voice here is important. Had Paul inferred that his confidence rested on his experience or his response to God, then he would have used the active voice that is demonstrating that it was what he had personally done that brought him assurance. Then we'd be forced to compare our experience with Paul's as the standard for assurance. But he used the passive voice, which means that he had nothing to do with the action, but rather he was acted upon. His confidence rested in the work of another, not his own. I am sure. I couldn't be too sure if it's up to me. But if it's up to God, then I'm pretty sure, okay? I'm sure. He sees sure that nothing's going to separate him from that. The word separate here means to violently tear from completely divide. Paul says nothing that can happen to us can finally and completely separate us from the love of God. So what he's saying is that there's no state of being in which you could ever be separated from the love which is in Christ. Now I've heard people say, I've heard Arminians try to argue, well, I could separate myself. I can walk out. I can leave. I can just get away. Really? And I ask him, well, look at this text, and let me ask you something. Nor anything else in all creation. Are you part of God's creation? Did God make you? Are you part of that? Well, then, guess what? It leaves you out, too. You can't walk away. Nothing in all creation. You're part of that. You can't even separate yourself from the love of God. And listen, people, if it wasn't so, we'd all be separated. Those whom God saves, He saves forever. I mean, that's kind of the idea of eternal life, right? Those who God justifies, He justifies forever. If you have by faith come to Yeshua for salvation, He will never cast you out, John 6, 37. He'll never allow you to cast yourself out. He'll never allow anything. Powers and those, those, all those words, powers and principles, all those things are divine beings. Nothing's going to separate you. Believers, we really need to grasp this. Yahweh loves us as much as He loves Yeshua. I mean, just we could just stop and meditate on that for a while. How loved are you? Loves you as much as He loves His Son. Amen. Amen. Alright, let's move on. That, that end of that verse is so powerful. Okay? Just grasp it, okay? Hang on to it. Meditate on it. Memorize that verse. All right, here's another verse that to me, ugh, this is just... Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. You see what this verse is saying? 
Yeshua is saying in this, he's praying in this verse, Father, I want all the ones you've given me to be with me in heaven, to see my glory. I want them all to see it, Lord. I want them all with me. The first thing you have to understand in this phrase is, whom you have given me. Now, we've been over this many times in this study, but it's vital to understand. Notice what Yeshua said earlier, 637. All that the Father gives me will come to me, except, oh, no, there's not an exception clause in that one. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. Now, verse 35, if you back up in John, it shows that coming to Christ and believing in Christ are synonyms. All right? So whoever comes to me is whoever believes in me. All right? All that the Father gives me. The ability to believe on Yeshua requires divine enablement. It is only those who the Father enables to believe that come to Yeshua in faith. And all the Father gives are going to come. All of them. No one's left out. These are the people that the Father has given to the Son as a love gift. He loves the Son, and He gave the Son a gift for His death on the cross, His sacrificial death. The gift is us. Whew. Seems like He got ripped off. <laughs> Yeshua viewed the ultimate cause of faith as God's electing grace, not man's choice. Believers, that phrase, whom you have given me, we've said before, it appears seven times in this prayer. Now in Scripture, you know seven symbolizes completeness, perfection. This is the defining statement regarding believers. Believers are the given. You and me, all believers, since the work of Christ has been applied, we belong to Him. You've been given to Christ. So the given are the elect of God, that will believe in Him, and they will have eternal life. Now he says, Father, I desire that they be with me. The word desire here is from the Greek word thelo. Now, if you look up thelo in the New Testament, you see at times thelo means to wish. And it sometimes just simply means a wish. There are many instances where you'll see it that way. Well, in this context, almost all scholars are in agreement, which is a rare thing. Okay, whenever anybody gets, scholars get in agreement, that here, it means far more than a wish, as it often does in other places in the New Testament. For example, Matthew 8, 23, And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Yeshua stretched out his hand, and he touched him, saying, I will. And he was cleansed. That was his desire. He didn't mean, I wish. I wish you would get better. Hope it happens to you someday. No, it was His will. In other words, this word is a word that expresses the determination of our Lord. Of his will over against a wish. In our text in John, it expresses a very, in a very strong way the will of our Lord. Father, I desire... <coughs> the sense... This is my intimate position. Intent. This is my intent. I want you... I want these people to be with me. It's not a wish. It's an expression of the will. Now, this raises the question, does the Son will something differently than the Father? I mean, maybe here the Son says, I will they be with me? And the Father goes, mm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't know if I want that too. You think that ever happened? Hopefully by now, in our study, you know, no. Okay, they don't have different wills. All right? Look at John 4.34. Yeshua said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me. This is a declaration of Yeshua's priorities. He was speaking figuratively of sustenance that comes from doing the will of God. My thing that carries me is doing His will. That's the thing that sustains me, that keeps me alive. That's what drives me. It's not bread. It's the will of God. All right? John 5.19. So Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord. He doesn't act independently of the Father, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. In Yeshua, we've said this over and over, in Yeshua we see Yahweh 
That's why Yeshua came to reveal the Father. He, whatever He did, whenever He acted, it was Yahweh. Whatever He said was the Word of Yahweh. There's no moment in His life, no action in which He doesn't express the will of the Father. John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will. So when He says, I desire... I'm not, he's not seeking his own will. He's seeking the will of the Father. His point was he can't do anything independent of the Father. The Son's will is nothing but to advance the will of the Father. John 6.38 For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. The purpose of the incarnation was the Son would fulfill the Father's will. The Son doesn't act independently of the Father. He acts in submission to the Father. So when he says, Father, I desire, the Father says, yeah, me too. Me too. He's, it's just identical to the Father's will. We know that the Father is going to grant this request. They both will it. So Christ's will for us and the Father's will for us is that we be with them where they are and see their glory. That's his desire. Do you see what's happening here? Yeshua is praying us into heaven. Now, how's your security? People, we're going to heaven because the Son desires it. The reason that promise is fulfilled, the means for that to be fulfilled is the intercessory prayer of our Lord Yeshua, He's desiring the same thing the Father desires that the given, those you've given me, Lord, you're going to be with, they're going to be with me in heaven to see my glory. This is one of the most magnificent statements of the security of the believer that I think we have in all the Bible. I mean, I've read this I don't know how many times, but this week I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my word. You've got to get that. The will of the Son is not independent of the Father. They both will. Now you think, I know, this is the sad thing. There's people today, Christians today, who think God doesn't get what He wills. Like God's up there in heaven, He's wringing His hands. Oh man, I wish they'd come to me. I wish they'd believe in me. Oh man, I'm just so fr That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible gets what He wants. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever He chooses, okay? Because He's God. And what He desires, He gets. And that's exciting to me because He desires that we'll be with Him. And guess what? We're going to be with Him. We're going to be with Him. You know, if anyone has any question about whether having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're safe and secure, think of this prayer. This should ease all your problems forever. Because if Yeshua prayed we'd be with Him, we'll be with Him. Now here, I think, is one of the simplest ideas of heaven. It's not so much a place. It's a person. To be with Him. Him. That's heaven. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about heaven, but here's something you know for sure, that the Lord wants you to be with Him and see His glory. And you're going to be with Him because He wants you to be with Him. It's a magnificent thing to think that the Lord prays for us. And He did it before we were ever born. Okay? Before we were ever born. He prayed for those who are believing, and furthermore, He also acknowledges that we have been given and actually, has, the Father has committed us into the Son's hand for keeping. Before we were ever born. That should give you a sense of security like nothing else. Yeshua's desire is that we be with Him and with the Father in heaven. And nothing will ever stop that desire from coming to pass. As long as you believe in the God of the Bible, because He's not frustrated. He gets what He wants. He is absolute Lord. This is eternal security. That the Son, all that the Father gives the Son, are going to come to Him. All the given come. And the Lord prays for us. He wants us to be in heaven. That should give you a sense of security. Like, and let me tell you something, people. It is so important as a believer that you have a sense of security. Because if you don't, you're always like, I don't know, does God love me? Listen, if you doubt that He loves you, what's your motivation for honoring Him by your life? 
I don't even know if I am a Christian. What's the, why would I strive to live a Christian life? Why would I seek to honor Him? I'm not even sure if Him. But if you had this <laughs> security of knowing I'm a child of God, let me represent my Father in an honorable way with all I say and do. Because my security it, and my actions have nothing to do with my security. So I can charge out there and say, I'm loved by God. I want people to know who this God is who loves me unconditionally. It's a beautiful thing, folks. Now, through the years, the subject of eternal security has been hotly debated in theology. I know you all are aware of that. There are people who have always believed, and many who believe it even as we speak, that this salvation which is granted us by Christ can be lost. How, how do you live like that? You wake up and you think, how, did I, how was my performance today? Uh, did, you know, did I do okay? Am I still in good? You know, I'm on the verge. How, how am I? What, what, if, what if Yeshua's desire is frustrated? I mean, what if He wants us, but too bad He doesn't get what He wants? What if His prayers go unanswered? I think that an in-depth study of even this chapter alone should change your mind on the security of the believer. Just 17 alone. But going to the whole Gospel, you know, our security is something that is really stressed. Christ gets what He prays for, and He prays for us to be with Him in heaven. This, is, this excites me, people, okay? Uh, I'm going to be there, okay? Because my Lord is praying for that. And He gets what He wants. Look at John 10, 28 and 29. He's talking about His sheep. He says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of My hand. That's security, right? I, I'm giving him eternal life. Nobody. Listen, do you know he's the God of the universe? No one, he says, can snatch them out of my hand. But just in case you have any doubts, let me put it this way. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Okay, so they both got a hold of us, alright? When the Father gives his sheep into the omnipotent hand of the Son... He still hangs on to us. He's not letting us go. They're both holding on to us. In verse 12 of this chapter, Yeshua said that wolves are going to attack the flock. And the word he used for attack is the same word that's translated here, snatch. Concerning this text, A.W. Pink says this. He says, No stronger passage in all the Word of God can be found guaranteeing the absolute security of every child of God. I might argue with him on that because I think John 17 is stronger. But we'll let that go for another time, all right? Look at how Jude ends his, ends his letter. And his letter is about apostasy, falling away. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. When he's writing a letter about apostasy, people falling away. Now to him who is able to keep you and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to only God our Savior, through Yeshua the Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time, and now and forevermore. Amen. Now now here is a conjunction that marks a shift in the letter. This is, introduces the doxology. Now to Him is literally now to the One. This refers to Yahweh the Father, the author of the divine plan. In light of the great danger in which Jude's readers are exposed, he deliberately emphasizes that it is God and God alone who is able to keep them. To present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. Because of your position in Christ, you're able to stand in the presence of the glory of Yahweh with joy. Not fear, not shame, not cowering. You know, and some people have that idea, we get there, we're just going to have our head down. I'm so sorry, Lord. I, you know, I know I shouldn't even be here. No, your head will be lifted up. I deserve to be here. Because I died in Christ. I have His righteousness. This is amazing. Blameless. Amormas. It literally means without spot, without blemish, above reproach. It was used to describe the absence of defects, listen, and sacrificial animals. And figuratively of the Lamb of God is unblemished. We're unblemished because we're in Christ. 
in Colossians 1.22. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You're blameless people before him. Because we're in Christ. Now listen, anyone who knows the God of the Bible, anyone who has read the Tanakh, you would think that being in the presence of God would cause fear and shame. But by the work of Yeshua and the grace of God, we know that we can go to God with joy, with fear being banished because we are righteous in Christ. That's our security. He says, to see my glory that you've given me. Now, you don't see it in the ESV here, but this is another purpose clause, all right? So that, so that you will be able to see my glory that has been given to me. He wants us to be with him to see the glory that the Father has given him. Now, you notice that the glory that our Lord speaks about here is the glory that's given to him. Well, in verse 5, Yeshua prays to have his glory restored. Father, restore the glory that I had. That's what he's talking about. See, the original disciples had seen Yeshua's glory. John 1.14 talks about it. They saw His glory. How did they see His glory? Can you imagine walking with Him and watching the miracles that took place? And Nicodemus said, look, we know you come from God because no one can do the things you do except God's with them. Obviously, men don't do that kind of stuff. I would have loved to have been in that boat. In the midst of the storm, you're afraid to death. See, the sea was the underworld. So they're afraid the underworld's going to get us and suck us right down, and they're afraid to death. And all of a sudden, Yeshua shows up and says, peace be still, and it goes flat, and you'll, you turn around and you're at shore. This is the coolest thing, Lord. They saw His glory. Okay? But they saw it in His incarnation. He wanted them to see the glory that the Father was going to restore His pre-incarnate glory. The full glory of God. He says, because you love Me, and we saw earlier the Father loves the Son, and this love existed before the foundation of the world. Once again, the preexistence of the Son is mentioned in connection with the relationship He shared with the Father in eternity past. We saw this in the very first sentence of this book. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Here, John Eliezer uses the Greek word me which means to be or exist, and suggest continued existence. Listen, at the beginning of eternity, can you go back that far in your mind? Before nothing ever existed, the Word did with the Father. I can't go back that far. I can go future a long, long ways, but I can't go back to before the world began. All right? With these opening words of the prologue, Eliezer traces the origin of the Word back to eternity, when God was present with the Son before anything else existed. Having fellowship with each other. The Father loved the Son in eternity past, and the triune God was active in redemption in eternity past. This phrase is used several times in the New Testament. Before the foundation of the world. We see it in Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed to my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. When did he prepare this kingdom? Before the foundation of the world. What? Before you ever came on the scene, God loved you. And you know what I like to think? That's a good thing because He probably wouldn't have loved us once He met us. All right? <laughs> Before the foundation of the world, He chose us. Look at Ephesians 1.4. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, in the Father's love for the Son, He chose a people to give Him for His suffering on the cross. And that people are the given. You and I. In verse 25, He continues His prayer, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know You, I know You. And these know that You have sent Me. He prays, O righteous Father. Earlier He says, O holy Father. Now I want you to think about this is easy to skip over. Righteous Father. Okay, that's cool. That's just a title for God. Let's go on. But let's, let's think about this for a minute. Think about when he prayed this prayer. Think about what's about to happen. What's about to happen here in his life? The crucifixion. All right? Listen. Righteous Father. Looking at it physically, this seems to be anything but righteous. Anything but just. 
This Son of God, who loved people, who healed people, who did nothing but nice, kind things, is about to undergo a false trial. He's about to be whipped. He's about to be crucified and buried. Does that sound righteous to you? Looking at it physically, nothing about the cross seems righteous. But if we understand it spiritually, we realize that it's through this injustice that the deep and powerful justice of God is displayed. Here God proves Himself to be both just and the one who justifies those who believe in the Son. Look what Paul said in Romans 3.26. It was to show His righteousness. Again, we're talking about the cross. God's going to show His righteousness at that present time so that He might be just and the, one who ju and the justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. Now let me ask you something, people. How can God be just when He lets unjust sinners go free? How's that just? To be righteous and to declare as righteous those who are guilty, that doesn't seem righteous at all. You, a judge would, you'd just have a fit if a judge did this. It's wrong. God's righteousness would dictate pour out your wrath on guilty sinners. That's righteousness. That's justice. But if God is going to justify the ungodly, listen, then someone, namely Yeshua, had to bear the wrath of God to show that God was just. How is God just in the justifier? He's just because He punished us. He didn't let us go. said this over and over. You're not slipping in the back door of heaven. You paid the price in Christ. That is why the word propitiation in verse 25 is so important. Christ bore the wrath of God for our sins and He turned it away from us. Christ is our propitiation. Propitiation means the alleviation of wrath <coughs> excuse me, by the offering of a sacrifice. That is, out of love for the glory of God, Christ absorbs the wrath of God that was rightfully ours. So that it might be plain that when we are justified as a gift by His grace, that the redemption that is in Christ, God will be manifestly just and righteous in counting righteous those who have sinned. He's just. And He's a justifier. It's amazing. He put to death His Son for our sin. Understanding this, you know, you start understanding salvation, you start understanding security. Well, I see why I'm secure now, because it has nothing to do with what I do and how I perform, because Christ paid my sin debt. He bore it for me. And I'm righteous. It's hard, for, it's hard to get Christians to understand that they're righteous. Because you're looking at your practice. Your practice, I agree, it's not righteous. Okay, I'll give testimony to myself and plenty of others. Okay? But your position before God is you are righteous. You stand in Christ. And that position should motivate and drive your practice. And I think that's where we have it backwards. You try to get Christians, you've got to perform and perform and perform, and then you'll feel good. No, understand the truth. Doctrinally, you stand in God righteous. Now, that should motivate you to go out and be righteous. Knowing he's about to die, this sin-bearing substitutionary Lamb of God addresses his Father as righteous Father. You're righteous in putting me to death because I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for others. You, me, we put him to death. He did it for us. He didn't have to go. He didn't have any sin. He says, O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you. Here, world is from the Greek word cosmos. And if you look up all Lazarus, use of cosmos, you'll see that he, he uses the term in different senses. In John 3.16, it's simply a term for the elect humanity. God loves his elect. Here it's used of the spiritually corrupt world system dominated by Satan. The world, they don't know you. They can't know you. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit. They can't know you, Father. They can't know you. But I know you. And these know that you have sent me. <clears throat> he says, I know you. 
And these know, the elect, the righteous, they know that you sent me. Even though the world does not know who Yahweh is, listen, it does not mean that Yeshua's mission was a failure. Because he didn't come to save the world, he came to save the given, his elect. He didn't fail in anything he came to do. He came to his own, but his own received him not because they weren't part of the elect. All that the Father has given to him, know that Yeshua was sent by the Father. <clears throat> he says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. I have made known to them your name. The theme of the manifestation of the Father's name is picked up from 17.6 and refers to Yeshua's revelation. Listen, whenever he talks about the name, just take out the word name and put in character. Because that's what it means. The character. I have made known to them your character. That's what Yeshua did. He manifests the character of God to us. The term name is simply a Hebraic expression that refers to all that a person is. That person's character. His being. His actions. So to manifest the name is to declare the nature of God. They have seen Yeshua. If they've seen Yeshua, they've seen Yahweh. Yeshua made God known. And listen, the only way anybody will ever know God is through Yeshua. I don't care what TV preachers tell you. There's no way around it. It's only through Christ. Okay? I don't care if you are Jewish. You still need Christ. <laughs> For a preacher to say, Jews don't need Christ. I would ask, who did he come to? He came to his own. Now, who were his own? Ugh. The church for 10 years was nothing but Jewish. But the Jews have another covenant, Hagee says. Hagee's a false prophet, people. Okay, plain and simple. He's a false prophet. He is telling the Jews they don't need the gospel. What kind of gospel, what kind of message is that? To anybody, you don't need the gospel. I will continue, he says, to make it known. Well, wait a minute. You're leaving us. How are you going to continue to make the name known? How does he do that? Well, he's sending the Spirit, remember? The Spirit's going to make it known. All right? Uh, the Comforter's coming. He's going to make it known. The Word of God, they're going to, the Apostle's going to write the Word of God. He's going to continue to make the name of God known through the Spirit and through the Word. He says that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is another purpose clause. Yeshua made know your name, the name of Yahweh so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. The concluding statement here of this entire prayer appropriately reflects the presence of Yeshua dwelling permanently in the believers. I in them. Colossians, the way Paul put it in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't hope anymore. We got glory. He's in us. This is union. We are one with Christ. Now, we talked about this phrase, those of you who have given me, being used in this prayer seven times. Again, the number seven speaks of perfection, completion. Yahweh gave to the Son a people, and all those people will believe in Christ, and they're going to be with Him in heaven for eternity. We're secure, believers, because we've been chosen by the Father and given to the Son. That is security. Now, in reference to the use of seven in this prayer, I just wanted to share with you in closing out this series, A.W. Pink has this to say. He says, A careful analysis of the prayer reveals the fact that just as the Lord urged the one petition which He made for Himself by seven pleas, so supported the seven petitions for the people by seven pleas, it is also to be observed that in this prayer, believers are, con are contemplated in a sevenfold revelation to be the world, there are seven gifts referred to in this chapter, four of which are bestowed upon the mediator and three upon the people. So, you know, he's stressing the number of sevens that are used in this prayer. And you can't get more perfect than the Son of God praying to the Father. And the things that he prayed for in this prayer are just amazing, people. He prayed for our unity. We have unity. We have Jew and Gentile united in one body. It was a mystery in times past. We have a security that is beyond anything we can ever imagine. 
It's not really surprising to me to see all these sevens in our Lord's High Priestly Prayer. Let me leave you with this. Father, I desire that they also whom You have given Me may be with Me where I am and see My glory. I want you to, if you remember nothing else from this morning, please remember this. Yeshua's desire is that you be with Him and the Father and see His glory. And you will. Let's pray. Father, thank You this morning, Lord, for the privilege to look at Your Word. Lord, I feel like we've been on holy ground to stand by and listen to You pray for us. Lord, the encouragement. Father, I rest on Your security, Lord. I realize, Lord, we are miserable wretches in and of ourselves. But because of Your love, we stand righteous before You. Lord, may that positional righteousness motivate us to be a people who display Your glory to the world around us. May we be kind. May we be loving. May we be righteous in a practical way that people may look at us and say we belong to You. Thank You, Lord, for Your grace to us. Amen. <laughs> Jack. This is kind of an off topic question, but at the same time, on topic. Um, when I was reading, I heard Jesus talking about how he's going to come to the world. What I mean by off topic is, I just learned in school how old the earth is. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Faith, because faith is a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Pure and simple. It all comes from God, even the faith to believe. It's a gift. Do what? That's right. You know, that, I mean, I, I love that prayer. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> you know? that, I mean, I, I do love that prayer because I'm just like before, Lord, Lord, you know how weak I am. I believe, but please help my unbelief, help my, in my weakness. And, you know, I just, that's a great prayer. Stan? I mean, he loves us like he loves Christ. That's all you got to wrap your head around. You can't be loved less. No, he's not going to love you less. And that's an encouraging thing because the way we base things on is on performance. If you perform, what I have a set of standards for you. What you know, and you have for, everyone has a set of standards for them. If they do this, 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 then I love them. Right? I mean, okay, you know what I minute? Don't you want to admit that? <laughs> is it just me? You know it's true, okay? If people live up to our expectations, then we love them and we treat them like, you know, right. God, God, God has no expectations in us. We're in His Son. He doesn't love us. I don't care how mad we mess up. He's like, Son, I'm going to spank you, but I still love you. I love you like I love Christ, okay? That'll never change. There's nothing that can alter that. Anthony. Yeah, I, I have, you know, the thought came to my mind uh, you know, we say, you know, we believe in God, get, you know, we're some children of God and stuff. And, you know, a thought came to my mind, uh, like when people, like, sin or mess up one time or whatever, and then you have a person who mess up and all this stuff and just keep on messing up. We should not try to, knowing that, that security that we have, we, we shouldn't just do things purposely because we say, okay, be in there, so to speak. I agree. And see, that's the big argument. Oh, if you tell people they're, they're safe and it's secure, then they'll go and mess up because they're... No, that's, you don't understand. When you really understand what God's done for you, what listen, people, what motivates us or what should motivate us is not fear. It's gratitude. What's a stronger motivation? I'm doing this, but I don't want to, but I just know I don't do it, I'm going to get beat. That's a lousy motivation, you know? That's how children operate, okay? There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And when you really understand, this is what doctrine's about. When you understand doctrine, you understand what Christ did for you, you understand your security, gratitude is the greatest motivation force ever. It's just the greatest motivation. I do it because I want to, because I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done. That's why you have to know theology. Because when you know these doctrines, you know what Christ did for you, if there's not gratitude, then something's broken, Okay? Because it's amazing. I never will forget when I came to understand that I was saved by His grace and not by my good works. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my circle of friends, as I preached that, there was a, the fear of people going wild, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. But what you just said, my heart was just, He saved me by His grace. My heart just overflowed and then wanting to live for Him better than I ever had before. Mm -hmm. He saved me. Amen. Before that, I was going to offer a comment that is a compliment. Uh, I have to give it to you, Brother David. You are an awesome, talented, gifted <laughs> teacher of the Word. Amen. Amen. Glad, glad, glad. No. <laughs> well, if I ever grow up, <laughs> I don't have much hope at this point in life. <laughs> But uh, let me tell you what, you know, when you, again, I said this last week, but I, I just let me say it again. Those of you who support this ministry, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because I get to do what I love so much. It's so, I don't know, to, to just spend time studying the Word of God, to teach the Word of God. You know, and one of the, and I ask you to pray with me. One of my prayers is, Lord, help me to see the truth, no matter what doctrine of mine it disrupts. Because, you know, I'm hardcore Calvinist, but I only am because I see it in the Word of God. Now, if I see something different, I'm not hanging on to something because I like something, okay? I don't have a dog in the fight. I just want to be lined up with the Word of God. Amen. So my constant, but I know I have prejudices and I have all this baggage and stuff, so and I'm just, Lord, show me what's there. 
Help me to see it. And I'd appreciate your prayers with me on that issue. You know, that we would pray together, the Lord would open our eyes. You know, because there's nothing... It'd be stupid to try to chase something that's not in the Bible just because we like it. Okay? Let's just... Well... <laughs> I know it is, but I've always, saw, I've always saw it as foolish to support a doctrine just because you like it. If it's contrary to the Word of God, who are you fooling? You know? Yeah, where is it going to, you know, I know this isn't right, but I'm going to hang on. You know, no. Throw it out. Throw it out. Charity, good job. You kept us on the line today. Appreciate that. No way. I want to thank for sending Steve Sheffler his book. Steve Sheffler is now a preterist. Wow. Amen. Now, just think, he's done, what, six or seven years of those tapes. Right. <laughs> he came here, he served my blah, 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 right. and rejected it. <laughs> but Brother Glenn, he said, what a great man God he is. Mm -hmm. You know, sent me that book and mm -hmm. he said, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you laid the foundation. And that's a story we hear over and over. You know, you send people Glenn's book, and, and then we sing the song, Another One Bites the Dust. You know? 